Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me introduce our second speaker, Ken. But before, I would like to tell you my personal story, which is associated with him. Um, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, I read his book. And the name of this is uh, probably one of the most, most cult book. It's called The Adventures of Jonathan Glibel. And this book is really famous. This book was translated to, I think, 100 languages? Uh, 54 languages. Okay, fine. But it was translated, not so, ma not, not so many, but it was definitely translated to Slovak language and also to Czech language. And I, I read his book in Slovak language, and I really like it because uh, the, the book, it's just a uh, group of different tales, how uh, it, it's called like Free Market o Odyssey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's like how the ideal world should, should work with based on free markets. And I really like this book. And then I, last year I, I went to, to Colombia. I did a big trip in Colombia. And by coincidence, I, uh, I got some information that there was, there was some libertarian uh, meeting in Bogota. So with my girlfriend, we, we went to this libertarian meeting and we met them there. And it was like, a, whoa. Big coincidence, and he was the writer of the book I really love and I read in the past. Uh, so uh, we met them, Ken and and his uh, uh, and his wife and and their their children. So it was a really big shock for me that now I I, I could or I, I could meet personally the writer of my, my of my really favorite favorite book. So immediately I proposed Ken to come to HCPP Congress. And he finally came, so welcome, Ken. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel. Appreciate it. I did have a layover in San Francisco about a half an hour. You know, they, the, the pilot said that he heard some strange noises in the airplane uh, on the engine, so it took them about a half an hour to find a new pilot. Um, I'm very, very grateful to be here. Uh, my wife, who's sitting uh, right here in the second row, and I have uh, spent the last several decades uh, organizing conferences and seminars and doing uh, summer camps to uh, promote free markets ideas uh, and philosophy of liberty. Um, and so we're very much uh, into this with our daughter. Uh, Pavel mentioned my book, The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible. I hope you'll find it in any language that suits you. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that the, uh, uh, the Czech edition was published by Joseph Shima here many years ago. And then uh, since then, we have two uh, Slovak editions and a German edition, uh, the Polish edition, many others. I'm s and, and just this week, the uh, uh, Afghanistan is publishing the Dari edition of the book. It's to make fr economics fun and interesting. The epilogue of the book has been turned into a little animation called The Philosophy of Liberty in 46 languages. So you can look that up on the website, jonathangullible.com. Um, we also uh, uh, have found that the book has been turned into plays that have toured uh, high schools throughout Slovakia and uh, across five countries of uh, the universities in Africa. And one uh, woman has produced it into a musical production for uh, elementary school kids in uh, Kazakhstan. Our daughter is very much a part of our activities. She's now living in, in Panama. She went to school in England. And she worked for three years in, in Chile uh, for Simon Black in uh, an organization called uh, si uh, Sovereign Man, trying to help people find locations around the world, way, ways of internationalizing themselves. So they might have passports in a variety of different places, res re residences and properties and, and employment and, and uh, assets of all kinds um, out of the touch of government controls. And that's something that they've been trying to do. When we were in uh, uh, Colombia with uh, Pavel last uh, winter, we also m went to uh, in uh, met up with a lot of people from Venezuela. It's an interesting story in Colombia and Venezuela. Just you know, a couple decades ago, there were all these terrible drug wars that were ruining the lives of the people in Colombia. So three million people moved from Colombia uh, into Venezuela for refuge. And they were greeted quite warmly and, and, and uh, helpfully. And now they've all come back to escape uh, Maduros and, and Chavez 
and they've come back to Colombia, and another one and a half million Venezuelans are also coming uh, to uh, Colombia to escape the, the horrors of the socialist uh, state there. Um, I find that there are many kinds of people, uh, those who want to control others, you all know what they are like, uh, those who are content, they, they like or accept the, the controllers. There are people who are not content with it, and they stay to resist in various ways, but of course the resistance is also a kind of a tax on their life and their liberty. And there are those who seek to escape or to opt out, get, find some way to completely uh, escape those who are tyrannizing them. I'd like to see a show of hands in here of the number of people here who are currently residing in a country uh, other than the country of their birth. Okay, well, you've experienced that. And I'm curious, how many people would like to be able to go to another country just in case things get bad? Where are you from? I guess a lot of us can identify with that, that's for sure. Um, that's going on around the world. As you know very much here, the, the presence of uh, uh, migrants from various hot spots in much of the world. I was so impressed when I met... Uh, uh, a couple years ago, Patrick Mardini with the Lebanese Institute for Market Studies, he told me about how interesting Lebanon is. Lebanon is a country of 4 million people, and there's 12 million Lebanese expats living abroad, outside of Lebanon, but all over the world, mostly in the Western Hemisphere, he says, and doing quite well. And uh, also, Lebanon is the location of 2 million Syrian refugees and another, probably another million and a half uh, Palestinian refugees. And yet, the country of Lebanon, with all of, its, with all of its troubles and divisions and so on, seems to be a refuge from some other worse places around the world. There are also the Rohingya uh, refugees, the Muslims who lived in Myanmar, in Myanmar Burma, and they've uh, had to flee because of the torment and brutal treatment that they've received over the years. They've tried to go where they could, uh, but haven't been very welcomed or in wherever they tried to go, and their situation is quite desperate. Uh, we're very close personal friends with uh, Yonne Park and Shin Dong Yuk, two North Koreans who were very, very lucky to have escaped out of the thousands that have tried and didn't succeed, or the thousands that are still in sexual slavery or various kinds of slavery in, in China. Yonmi Park even writes about it in her very fascinating book about how it was when she and her mother and her sister left and were two years in sexual slavery in China because actually they knew that um, they were at their beck and call because if they were returned to North Korea, which is what the official policy is in China, they could have been put to death or put to uh, uh, prison camps and their lives would have been absolutely ruined. But they were fortunate, uh, Yonmi Park was fortunate to be able to escape to Mongolia, where we had a conference just this last summer, Liberty International Conference was uh, hosting uh, um, its world conference in Mongolia and we would have had uh, Park jong Oh uh, at the conference, but he received uh, very serious threats that the North Korean government was interested in trying to kidnap him and take him back to North Korea. And I'm very, very pleased to see that he is going to be here, and I'll finally get to meet him here in, uh, in, uh, at your conference here in Prague. Um, we're also in the United States, we have lots of people from all over the world who are interested in going to the United States, and I'm very, very pleased to have heard the presentation by uh, Trayvon Keith, who just talked uh, the previous uh, hour about his experiences and travails. Um, as you know, uh, President uh, Trump has announced that he wants to have a 2,000-mile uh, wall built along the southern border between the United States and Mexico. It's going to be nine meters high and, and, and two meters deep, costing at least $2 billion, $20 billion uh, to try and keep uh, people from uh, finding that refuge across the border. And for years, people have faced lots of hor hor horror stories. Um, for example, the, the cruise ship that was fined $3,000 per head for the people that they rescued at sea, which was required by international law of the, of the ships and so on, but now they all look, they, many of them will look the other way because of the fines that they can be uh, met with. Um, this man, Walt Staten, in Arizona was trying to help the hundreds of people who just died out in the desert uh, trying to get across the border, and he said, well, I know where some common pathways are, I think we'll put out bottles of water 
on these paths so they won't die of thirst and starvation and, ex and exposure. And uh, for this, he was uh, arrested and charged with the crime of littering. And uh, his uh, conviction, the sentence was 60 days uh, of uh, community service. And he said, well, I thought that's what I was doing. Other people are not so sure that these walls will have much effect. Uh, Penn and Teller, two uh, comedians in the United States, decided to hire um, nine immigrant refugees and say, well, let's build a wall to spec and see how long it takes to get to the other side. And he put them into three teams and offered a prize to see who could get over the wall first, either over, through, or under. And all three teams got to the other side in less than three minutes. Already the teams have been developing uh, ways that are quite uh, the match for these big walls as well. Um, movement of people around the planet is all part of our history and prehistory. It's the, it's the course of humankind. To move for opportunities, yes, but often fleeing tyranny, fleeing oppression, fleeing famine, and terrible, terrible times. And we do it not only for ourselves, but we do it for our families and for our existence. And um, it's been a, a part of the story of so many, well, almost all the religions of the world have known this, that their leaders and, and the forebears have been ones who had to move for famine, had to move from persecution, had to move uh, uh, to, for, for opportunities. And it's something that people in the Pacific, in the, uh, the, the, the Vikings in the north, the Indians in the south, people have always been moving for these purposes. Some people came to the Americas uh, unwillingly, you know, as slaves. They were bought by the slave ships that came over to uh, the Americans and became part of the workforce for the southern plantations. And of course, they weren't pleased with that condition. A lot of them did try to flee, and they, had to, they couldn't flee just to the northern states where there wasn't slavery because the Fugitive Slave Act said, well, your property that stole itself and under the law has to be returned to its rightful owner. So they had to flee all the way to Canada or to Mexico where slavery was not allowed, and then they could be free. They were often aided and assisted by the Underground Railroad. That's people who would hide them at night in barns and churches and, and secret them out through the, uh, through the nighttime uh, to places of safety. If they were arrested, they were all convicted. But sometimes the juries refused to convict because there was a principle called jury nullification that said that the jury had the right to rule not only on the case, but on the law itself. Was it right or wrong? And many times they, they overturned it, saying it was right that a person should try to steal themselves away from tyranny and to find freedom. Another thing that's uh, obvious about this, it doesn't matter on which side of the border the guard stands. The effect is the same, whether it's someone trying to keep the prisoner in or whether it's someone trying to keep the prisoner on, uh, out. Also, a lot of times people say, well, were these slaves uh, economic refugees or political refugees? And I find it indistinguishable because people who are economic refugees are also refugees from the political system that tyrannizes them. They may not recognize it as such through as political philosophers, and they may not raise a political protest, but their very desire to move with their feet from one place to another is the desire to find freedom for themselves and for their families, and I consider that both justifiable. Now you, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to have been able to be invited here to Prague because I know you people, the people here in Prague and throughout Central Europe and all, know the history of torture and torment of the 20th century for the people, maybe not this generation, but that your, your parents and your grandparents lived through the horrors of, that are unimaginable. Um, and of course, the tyrants are quite obvious. Everybody knows and written about them and what monsters they were. And we've had some great refugees, people who escaped, thank goodness, because they've been uh, pillars of great wisdom and science and knowledge and, and things that we've been able to benefit enormously by. A lot of people know Anne Frank uh, because of her diary and her, her personal story. They know that she died in the gas chambers. What people don't know so much about is that Otto Frank, her father, twice applied to the United States for a visa for their escape and twice was denied. So to me, that means that the United States government was also a collaborator 
with the, the things that tormented them and that, that they later suffered, along with millions of other people who could have, have escaped but were not allowed to. The council at Evian, uh, 1938, I believe it was, 30 nations around the, around the Atlantic all agreed that the quota is full. And they're not going to increase it for the Jews and the others who would be fleeing this tyranny and personal torture. And it was after this that the Germans at the Wannsee Conference decided, well, we can do whatever we want to to the Jews and the others because the rest of the world doesn't really care about them either. There, are, fortunately, there were lawbreakers. There were lawbreakers that some people know about. Oskar Schindler was made famous by the, uh, the movie Schindler's List. But there are others that saved many more people. Chiyune Shinohara and uh, Dr. He Fun Chang from uh, the, the, the consulate at the, at the uh, Japanese consulate in Vilnius in Lithuania and the Chinese consulate in the, in the embassy in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the consul, in, uh, consul general in Vienna. They wrote out hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands, of visas to help the Jews to escape uh, to out, outside the... Uh, uh, the, the torture, the, the brutality that they were expecting. Of course, the numbers are just astounding for how horrible that, that last century has been. And a lot of people know very well of all the millions who died in the concentration camps of uh, Nazi Germany. But not too many people are aware of the magnitude of the death of democide. Communist democide, the communist regimes. Rudy Rummel, a professor at the University of Hawaii, has documented uh, as best he can the numbers of death of people by their own governments, not in international conflict, not from war to war, but their government's tyranny, taking their own tax money and using it to slaughter them or to starve them to death or torture them. The numbers are astounding, uh, and here uh, even topping uh, uh, America's ally in World War II after Stalin did much of his uh, slaughter in, in uh, Russia, the Soviet Union. Uh, topping him uh, was Mao Tung. My wife will have some more to tell you about that story tomorrow. Fortunately, people have been able to escape those horrible, horrible times and wrote many stories about the the, the horrors of pushing people back into the arms of tyrants at the end of the war, and of the wall that went up. You all know about that, and, and your, your, your ancestors know very well about Prague Spring and what a fantastic breath of fresh air that was before it was crushed by the Soviets. These were all, thank you very much, absolutely wonderful here. What people find, though, is that the scene are a lot of people they don't know, faces that are unfamiliar perhaps threatening, and, and, it, and it's fearful. But what is not seen is what they can become, what they would be if they were allowed the freedom to move from a place of torture and torment to a place of freedom. The, uh, the opposite of that fear, well, the fear is the one that says we, we fear the person that is unfamiliar to us. But courage says, well, we welcome the person that is unfamiliar. Fear is, well, we don't want the competition in our, in our jobs. And courage says, well, we welcome the competition. Fear says we, we, we would deny them freedom. And courage says we welcome and champion freedom. Um, now, when you look at all this, you see a lot of the people who became famous and founded great companies and did great things. But suppose they weren't allowed to have fled their countries. What if they were all gone? Well, that is actually what happened. We do see the people that have made great achievements because they were allowed to come. But how many more giants of industry or science or literature could have come and could have made great achievements for all of us if they had been allowed to come but didn't? I leave two up here on this chart here. My wife, who uh, is here from China, and she'll tell her story tomorrow. And uh, my great-grandfather, he came from, from the Netherlands. And, of course, if they hadn't been allowed to come, it would have been a very different story for me. What drives immigration is often the policies that are voted upon by parties of all sorts, the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States and all the various political parties. People tend to support the things that their government does. 
And what governments do are horrendous for the people in other countries. The biggest form of welfare is the welfare to tyrants all around the world. This study here by the uh, African Development Bank says that about, consider all the money that goes to Africa as overseas development assistance. Three times that amount of money flees the country into the personal bank accounts of the rulers and the corrupt leaders of these countries. It's an enormous drain on those people and also makes it those people don't have to even be sensitive at all to the plight of their populations because they simply get this help from poor people in rich countries that goes to rich people in poor countries. And it's astounding the number of people, I mean, this is just the United States, but the people of, of uh, European, Western European countries are, are not at all immune to the, to the charges of, of assistance to some of the worst monsters in, the, in uh, recent time. I like uh, my particular uh, story that I talked to uh, my students about in classes about Mohamed Mossadegh. In 1951, he was championed as the man of the, of the year because he brought democracy for the first time to the people of Iran. Wow, what a great champion and hero. Two years later, Mohammed Bosadeg was overthrown by a coup called Operation, um, uh, Operation Ajax, a coup by the Central Intelligence Agency to get him out of office and replace him with Shah Riza Pahlavi, who was the, uh, essentially the puppet of the CIA. And then the British and the Americans split up the oil spoils. And this has been a, a, a history of oil, corporate oil interests throughout much of this time. Uh, after, uh, finally, uh, Muhammad, uh, I mean, the Ayatollah Khomeini and his uh, Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalism overthrew the Shah, who had been in place for 26 years under U.S. auspices, finally overthrown, then the United States sponsored this guy over here, as along with a lot of other people, a lot of other governments of Europe, and Japan sponsored uh, Saddam Hussein in an eight-year-long war to try and overthrow the Ayatollah Khomeini and to bring back the control that had existed before in the oil fields. A million people died, if not more, in that terrible, terrible time. Another kind of welfare that the United States and Europe and Japan even more so um, uh, impose a, a hardship on third world poor countries is corporate welfare in the form of protectionism and subsidies. Uh, for example, to sugar. Most of the third world poor countries could produce sugar that could be sold to the richest countries of the world, but they're not allowed to. Tremendous quotas that tremendously limit the amount of sugar that's brought in just to the former colonies. Uh, those countries could be selling their sugar to American consumers at five cents a pound. But Americans aren't allowed to buy that sugar from the rest of the world. They have to pay 20 cents a pound for American sugar, that produced in Hawaii. And then, yeah, that's not even enough. The US government even pays farmers to destroy their sugar, to keep prices higher, when they're not allowed in Central America, in, uh, Latin, uh, throughout Latin America, in many parts of the world that could be producing sugar and not allowed to sell it. The European governments are even worse. Half of, the common, half, half of the European Union budget, as I understand, goes to the common agricultural policy, which is a subsidy to supporting farmers in a very, very um, rich countries and denying the uh, opportunity for many countries of the world to sell the things that they're most adept at, selling the agricultural products. And worse, then they take the sur surpluses of, this, of these first world countries in the United States, Europe, and Japan, and then they unload it like massive amounts of rice to Haiti, undermining and destroying the farms of ha uh, Haitian farmers in, uh, uh, so that they can't even produce, they can't compete with all this free food from the United States or Europe or Japan. The, the Economist magazine says, if the rich countries were to remove the subsidies to agriculture, poor countries would benefit by more than three times the amount of all overseas development assistance they receive each year. That's foreign aid. Three times as much could go to them if they just simply allowed them to sell what they produce. Another horrible thing that's meted on the countries of these uh, 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 of third world countries is the drug war. This massive um, uh, boost 
to the profits of, of the black market that prohibition brings. I mean, we saw how prohibition brought the uh, enormous profits to the organized crime and gangs in the United States when, when they had prohibition for alcohol. When they got rid of that, that opportunity dried up. It became legal. But this same th sort of thing is going on with the drug war. Enormous profits are pouring into uh, drug lords all throughout the third world countries, and it's wreaking havoc on those countries with violence and crime and ha ruining markets in so many of those countries, and yet the United States doesn't recognize that it's a party to the troubles that those bring out. And they, the first thing, when an American president goes down there and says, why don't you grow something else other than marijuana or, or opium or coca, the very first thing every president in those countries says is to us, well, why don't you let us sell the things that would be better alternatives? Why don't you let us sell the sugar or the flowers or the corn or the things like that that, that uh, we can produce better even? A lot of people say, well, they just come to rich countries for the welfare. Well, I mean, I'm talking, I've already talked about the biggest kinds of welfare, the welfare to tyrants, the welfare uh, to drug lords, the welfare to uh, corporate uh, uh, interests. But is it really the welfare that causes people to risk their lives at sea, risking the, the, the sharks, the exposure, the storms, the, the, where a third of them die going across the, the, uh, the, uh, the straits between uh, Puerto Rico and, and uh, or, I mean, uh, between Dominican Republic and, and, and uh, uh, Florida? Is it the, 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 the welfare that causes people to risk their lives to go across the desert in Arizona? I'd say, no, they're going for opportunities. And I, I think I demonstrate this when I, saw, when I showed that once in America, migrants could move to the, to the states with the most welfare. But they don't. Overwhelmingly, the native population and the foreign-born population move to the states with the least welfare because there the taxes are lower and the opportunities for business and, and economic growth are much, much stronger. Plus, it isn't... It isn't the immigrants that cause the welfare system. It's the citizens who vote for these parties that establish a, a welfare system. It is the politicians that hand it out. And then they blame the outsiders for the consequence of this. Frankly, it is, it is, it is the politicians and the people who vote for them that are responsible for these welfare systems. And on top of it, they put up barriers against people working. They put up barriers against uh, people starting businesses. And that's a real tragedy. Uh, Stuart Anderson, executive director of the National Foundation for American Policy, says that uh, uh, immigrant entrepreneurs are the heroes of a market-based economy because they're driving innovation and job creation. They started 33% of the US venture-backed public companies between 2006 and 12. Many of these companies, you're familiar with their, their, whoop, their, their names because of the, um, the prominence in society and what they've brought. Uh, the Wall Street Journal says immigrants founded 51% of U.S. billion-dollar startups. Um, Adrian Furman says that the percentage of immigrants who start businesses as entrepreneurs is, is astounding when you consider the size of their numbers in the, in the general population. He says that the first generation uh, migrants start businesses at twice the rate of Native Americans and even of second generation immigrants. Half of the world's skilled Im migrants go to America and in 20 years created 25% of all American venture-backed companies. The sort of people who migrate have a different pattern of motivation, abilities, and adjustment. They are hungrier, more risk-taking, more hardy. And as a matter of fact, when you look at the characteristics of good entrepreneurs, there's almost a, an ideal match with the kinds of energy and diligence and courage that it takes to get up and move. People don't move because they're lazy. They move like this because they are energetic and eager to make uh, great progress. There are always exceptions. There are exceptions to every assertion that I'm making here, but by and far, by, by, large, by and large, the, um, the, the people who are moving are doing so with, with um, a very energetic and productive positive outlook. Look at this uh, work by uh, uh, Bradley Gardner. He looks at, uh, you know, the whole European Union. One of the precepts of the European Union was that it would be an open market where people could move around to where they get greater productive use. They get paid more. And they get, uh, you know, tremendous diversity of, of talents. In it. And in all of the European Union, he says 13 million 
have migrated within the European Union. I mean, it was an effort to try and make the European Union something like the United States, this big market where people could move all around and go to where their talents are best, uh, best use, used. In the United States, they had 40 million migrants from abroad. That was pretty beneficial, could have been a lot more. For the world, 300, 232 million internal migrants, or international migrants, people going across borders, as, as often indicated here. But China itself experienced 260 million internal migrants, just moving from provinces in the country were of low productivity to the eastern provinces that were mostly free economic zones. He said that in that 30-year period of time, poverty declined by 753 million people because of internal migration, which accounted for about 20 to 30 percent of GDP growth. I highly recommend his book, by the way. Now, I'm really a fan of the Economic Freedom of the World Index, produced by the Fraser Institute out of Canada. And they uh, compile this index, which uh, shows that by these very basic criteria of fiscal policy, monetary policy, legal policy, trade policy, and regulatory policy, that they can rank the countries of the world by their degree of economic freedom. And you know, ever since they started producing this ranking, the country that ranked at the very top, and I hope that it always remains there, is Hong Kong. Hong Kong's been way at the top even though China doesn't like to think of it as a separate country. And it's up there with Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, but down at the bottom, Venezuela, Myanmar, Zimbabwe, they, they chronically rank down there at the bottom as well. The countries at the top have overwhelmingly the greatest amount of wealth per person, they grow faster, and the countries at the bottom often have slowing or negative economic growth. Look what happened to those countries in 50 years, the countries of Latin America, they had a lot of resources, huge amount of land, lots of people. They should have been able to grow a lot. But in 50 years, from 1950 to 2000, maybe they grew maybe three or four times as much per capita, uh, wealth per capita. But in the Asian tigers that were poorer than any of those countries, they had 20, 35, or 40 times the amount of wealth per capita just in 50 years. Life was unrecognizable for their generations of the children and the grandchildren later on. Hong Kong now has a wealth per capita greater than the United States and, and, uh, and, and greater than all of their former colonial rulers, uh, I mean, the Britain and, and so on. They're doing extremely, extremely well, and I hope they continue to do so. Now, China does not rank very high on this Economic Freedom of the World Index. It's been moving up from a very low rank to here, but it's a big country. It's over a billion people, so if you break it out by provinces, and each province has more population than whole countries, then you find that some of these provinces are freer even than Hong Kong and, and Singapore, not by political freedom, but by economic freedom. The, the ability to produce wealth and goods and services without rest restraint and then and actually be able to keep it, it's extremely strong there. And that's what causes me to say that there's a, thick, a sixth criteria that should be added to the Economic Freedom of the World Index, and that's migration. Because those provinces have been the engines of economic growth for China and could be the kind of engines of growth if you had free economic zones in other countries as well. Um, uh, Ortega and Perry conclude through their research by saying openness to knowledge, skills, and ideas from the rest of the world may be one of the most important engines of economic growth and technological advancement for a country. We show that openness to immigration is a strong predictor of its income per person and works much better for immigration than for trade even. Um, it's what made it possible for a small fishing village in Xinjiang to turn into a, a huge metropolis, a city like Hong Kong today. In less time, Hong Kong itself was open to people and products, both. And it was that freedom that allowed them to, to, to grow and, uh, and, and become the stars of today. What stopped all those Chinese from coming to America was the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first racial and, and uh, immigration quota in the United States based on purely uh, racial, racial fear and, and fear of, uh, of labor competition. And the Chinese were excluded from coming to the United States. Thank goodness it was ended by the time my wife came. Um, but uh, it, it treated products, products had always, we'd always accepted arbitrary quotas in how many 
bags of sugar somebody should be allowed to buy, but now for the first time, some arbitrary determination by, politician, by, by politicians determined how many laborers people could be allowed to buy. No longer were contract companies allowed to go and offer labor contracts to immigrants from China and Japan, bringing them to Hawaii, where I live now, and, and producing the big sugar plantations. None of that's allowed anymore. Nobody can, can offer that sort of opportunity. Every country in the world says we want as much oil as we can possibly get. And every country of the world says, well, we, we've got to limit the people. Well, frankly, I think that people are a lot more important than barrels of oil, but they're the ones that are rejected. If you had a barrel of oil that could produce, reproduce itself, we would say that was, that was wonderful. Wow, that's just a blessing. But if you have a person who can reproduce themselves and make more children, that's considered catastrophic. Julian Simon is my favorite economist because he talks about the extraordinary benefits that human beings are. They're not just mouths to feed, they're brains and hands and arms and legs. And they're, they're able to produce greater and greater wealth with their numbers. They move to cities because that's where the great economies of, of uh, scale, uh, division of labor, specialization of labor, um, comparative advantage, all the, the advantages of, of crowds. That's why people move to cities. That's where the prosperity is. And uh, interestingly, um, the people in, uh, throughout the industrial world are um, actually having declining populations because their fertility rates are below the replacement rate. Most of the countries are in decline by population. The world's best um, birth control method is prosperity because people have fewer children when they have uh, more and more prosperity. Uh, to governments, people are a problem. They every time try to shut them out and the United States has just reduced the, 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 the cap on refugees to 18,000 in a world of, of 71 million refugees. Uh, for Chinese, it takes them 11 years waiting. Even once they've been admitted, it takes them 11 years before they can get uh, a green card. Immigration courts now are backed up. There's a million people in line. So to government, people are a problem. And we've, there's a lot to be said about uh, whether or not they, they cause crimes or not. I think most of the studies that I've seen show that the crime rate is lower for uh, immigrants than it is for uh, both legal and illegal immigrants than it is for uh, uh, the native-born population. But I know that's debatable because you all have personal experiences about that. Um, I might say that the United States has lots of crime, native-born. And one of the criminals was Timothy McVeigh, who planted a bomb and blew up the, the Murrah Federal Building, killing hundreds of people, men, women, and children. And he was uh, put to death. He was a part of all these hate groups around the United States that are, um, that are uh, you know, causing real terror in the United States as well as other places. Um, but now he came from New York. Holding people individually responsible is what a, a libertarian should do. You hold individuals responsible for the behavior. You don't collectively say, well, everybody from New York is guilty for his, for his crime. And therefore, we wouldn't allow anybody uh, from New York to come to the rest of the country. Although I've heard some people say that that should be uh, uh, questioned, though, since Donald Trump also comes from New York. To the markets, the people are an opportunity. All the things that they can become and do. When, when Walmart has a long line out, they don't just say, well, how can we restrict the people coming in? Any store says, well, let's put on more people at the cash registers. Let's make it smoother and easier for people to come. And I would suggest the United States government would be pretty well off in doing the same kind of thing. Is there enough space? Well, actually, there's a tremendous amount of space. The United States land area is only 3% of all the land area in the United States is for cities and suburbs. The rest is virtually unoccupied. I mean, there's agriculture, but there's lots of parks and, and, and uh, conservation and other things. There's a lot of space. And simply allowing one kind of freedom, the, the, the freedom to gamble, turned Las Vegas from a vast desert that no one thought could ever house any or support anybody into a huge metropolis, one of the largest and most prosperous in the country. Now, a friend of mine, Drew Souter in Canada, says, well, what if we made Hong Kong space available in, uh, in Canada? I mean, Hong, uh, the Queen Charlotte Island off the west coast of Canada could support uh, as many as nine Hong Kongs just by the area there. And that itself could support 65 million people if you took the same land area that it, Hong Kong occupies. And keep in mind, Hong Kong is by far the most densely populated country in the world. 
But 40% of the land area is still zoned country park where people aren't allowed to live. I mean, it's, it's not like everybody's stacked together. They live and they enjoy life much better than they do in, in China. That's why they move there. Much better than in Vietnam. That's why they move there. And yet, it's, uh, the opportunities for a Hong Kong style of, of existence is abundant in, Saint, uh, in Queen Charlotte Island in Canada. They just turned it into a free economic zone for people to go to. He says the same thing, this is Drew Souter, this, he says the same thing about the oil sands in Alberta. Everybody's so eager about the oil they could get. Oh, they could bring a, a current land value would be of uh, $40 billion, but it could bring in an estimated oil value of $14 trillion. What if they turned that into 24 Hong Kong zones? And they turned that uh, same uh, area of land into a, into a zone that could be generating um, you know, a growth for population and economic zones could be producing as much as five trillion dollars per year with an estimated land value of 30 uh, trillion, 750 th times more than it is currently. Well, maybe they could be a, find people in Canada accepted if they offered them a million dollars per person, man, woman, and child, to, to accept refugees up in the, uh, in the uh, sands. The, I, the, the ways of accommodating people is a matter of our imagination but don't leave it to governments to think of the ways of imagining it. Get the governments out of the way. And I, I assert that the voluntarism and the non-aggression principle is a good way to approach this. I do believe that excluders who want uh, to have the right to deny, to associate with anybody or to pay for anybody should have that right. No one should force them to associate with somebody or pay for anybody if they don't want to. But other people who are inviters, they should have the right uh, to contract with whomever they choose and to pay with their own money voluntarily um, for whatever enterprise or, or activity they want. The problem is that the government says, well, because we're separate, we're going to be treating ourselves as the excluders want us to be, not as the inviters want us to be. Solutions to along this mine might be to end the trade barriers so the people have greater prosperity where they live, uh, end the welfare to tyrants, and the welfare to the corporations, and the drug wars, and also the people quotas, limiting the number of people just on the basis of number as opposed to other criteria, which I, I think is arguable that other criteria might be found, but just simply not a number quota, which is arbitrarily the, the design of some politicians. Uh, and the welfare state in, fa in, in favor of voluntarism, um, labor and com commerce uh, restrictions, which prevents people from actually working in the places they go to, and nationalizing the land so that it's privatized and then people can decide for themselves what their own rights would be. Overall, free markets are practical, they're humanitarian, and above all, I consider them ethical. So I think we ought to treat other people as we would want them to treat us if we were in their shoes. So thank you. I hope I wasn't too much over time. Okay. Thank Thanks. So And thanks a lot for a beautiful uh, presentation. Any question? We have maybe one or two questions. Yep. Fascinating talk, and thank you very much for a fresh perspective. Uh, my question is a political viability, right? Where do you start? <laughs> right? Europe's going more restrictive, so is the States. Uh, you know, the, the trade winds are blowing against this. Where do you start? Yeah, that's a very good point, and the reason I do this talk every chance I get an opportunity to is because it's the, the first is to start the change of minds, and I, I think there are a lot of people, their minds are made up, and you're, you're not going to uh, persuade them. For the people who are, those are the excluders. For those who are inviters, I think you give them extra arguments and, and encouragement at what they're doing. But the vast number of people who are in between are just sort of undecided about it. And I'd say that a lot has to do, and politicians even respond to this, a lot has to do with what the people in between who haven't made up their mind think about it. Do they think of, of uh, immigrants as terrible, fearful things that we need to keep away from us? Or do we think of them as, as potential friends and, and uh, benefits to our society and to us personally? Um, frankly, I think it comes down to whether or not people are, are, are motivated by their fears or by their courage. And so it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, I don't want to stand up in front of a group of people that may be potentially hostile 
to this idea of opening migration to a lot more people to save lives. But whenever I think of the courage that it takes for somebody to cross those mountains, the deserts, the seas, something that I wish I had the courage to do myself, I don't know, it's not been tested. Would I have the courage to risk my life for myself or my family in the same way that thousands of migrants are doing all the time? And I don't know. I just don't know if I, if I would do it. But I do feel that I have at least enough courage to speak out on their behalf to try and persuade people that in these countries that hold their lives in their hands, that we can make a difference, we should be influencing our politicians, and the worst thing that we do is just to remain silent, because then the bad guys win. But that's, not, that's true of everything. And we, if we could become more fo vocal and more push back, it doesn't have to be as extreme as I'm suggesting, it could be a little bit, a little bit more sympathetic. Um, and and, and uh, aggressive with politicians on this, on this point. I think then we can turn the tide on this sort of thing. I mean, how different would the consequence have been for millions of people in, who, who died in Hitler's concentration camps if simply the United States had said, and, and all the other countries around the Atlantic said, yeah, okay, come on, here's a refuge. Help us become a part of the battle against Hitler, you know, instead of just saying, no, Whatever Hitler does to you is okay by us because you're out of sight and out of mind. So, um, hi, astounding talk. I have a question. So, um, Japan has a, an infamously isolationist um, refugee policy. They actually approve maybe only 0.2% of their asylums. And it is, an, it is a developed... Um, economically free country. So why do you think it never appears in the immigration conversation? Uh, that's a good point. Uh, and I lived in Japan for two years and I found them to be extremely gracious to me as a gaijin, as a, as a Westerner coming there to teach English and teach economics. But towards the Koreans, towards the Japanese, I mean towards the Chinese, towards uh, Vietnamese, towards black Africans, they were horrendously ra racist. And they do have this very, very um, strict apology against Koreans and so on. Um, but they're finding their population is really top-heavy now by age. You know, they, they've had so few births, and uh, soon they're going to f feel that they're in this big pressure to, uh, to support this enormous social security system for the elderly. And I think they're going to be uh, pressured into opening their borders more um, just for economic reasons, if not for... And they'll treat newcomers badly. Uh, they treated Westerners very well, but they'll treat people that they consider l worth less than them very badly. But once they get to use, used to them and get to know them, they have to treat them as, start to treating them as human beings. I mean, that's just part of human nature. With exposure comes a lot more... Um, ease. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, so thank you again, Ken, for your fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you for being, he being here and your questions.